No issue is more controversial and confusing than the right to free speech, especially when it's pitted against the desire of people not to feel attacked or hated simply because of their race, gender, or sexual orientation. Nadine Strassen, who served as the president of the ACLU from 1991 to 2008, is the author of the new book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. The book lays out a compelling argument against laws and policies that try to restrict what individuals are allowed to say. Strassen is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, and in 1978, the organization she would go on to lead famously defended the rights of neo-Nazis to march through Skokie, a Chicago suburb with a large Jewish population. Many residents of Skokie were survivors of German death camps who argued that the psychic pain of a Nazi rally would be brutally upsetting and could lead to violence. As the ACLU's brief in that case noted, the arguments for stopping the march were the exact same as those made 10 years earlier by the residents of Cicero, Illinois, who sued to stop Martin Luther King from leading a civil rights demonstration in their town. Strassen is now a professor at New York Law School in Manhattan. She sat down recently with Reason to talk about her new book, Why Hyperpolarization in American Politics Makes Free Speech Even More Difficult, and What Are the Best Ways to Counter Bad, Stupid, and Hate-Filled Speech. Nadine Strassen, thanks for talking to Reason. I'm delighted to be here. So what form do hate speech laws take today, and why should we be worried about them? In the United States, we do not allow speech to be censored merely because its message is deemed to be hateful uh, or hated by those who wield power. However, speech with a hated or hateful message, along with speech that conveys any other message, may be punished if, in a certain context, it directly causes specific imminent serious harm, such as a true threat or intentional incitement right. of imminent uh, punishable violence. Punishable incitement. So if you say, as there was a famous case, uh, there's a white guy, let's go get him. Exactly. That's that different. Was- uh, if you can write, and, and I if like, I can clarify, yeah. uh, it's different from the way we use inciting rather loosely right. in everyday speech. It's an appropriately strict standard. Right. The speaker has to intend to incite imminent violent right. or lawless conduct that is likely to happen imminently. So, uh, and and this is like you can write like I, uh, you know, Hitler was great on a brick. That might be objectionable, but it's not hate speech. If you throw that brick through somebody's window, that's a punishable crime. It could be a so-called hate crime or bias crime. Unlike hate speech, hate crime or bias crime is an acceptable legal concept. And what it means is you take something that would be a crime Otherwise, apart from its message, your example of throwing a brick is at least property damage and probably assault as well. If uh, you could, the government can show that that victim of the crime was singled out for a discriminatory reason, such as race, religion, or so forth, then it can be treated as a hate crime or bias crime and subject to a stiffer pen, uh, penalty on the theory that it causes more harm both to the right. victim and to society. But I would be careful. So in the United States, even though the Supreme Court has consistently struck down laws that punish speech based on its hateful content. And I have to stress, the Supreme Court justices across the entire ideological spectrum, from left to right, have agreed that that is a bedrock principle of freedom of speech. We can't punish it just because we despise the viewpoint. Nonetheless, like a lot of uh, human rights principles and civil liberties principles, this one is honored in the breach in many contexts. So we have many college campuses that actually are enforcing hate speech codes for all practical purposes. They don't label them as such anymore ever since the ACLU and FIRE and others have successfully challenged every single hate speech code. But under the guise of rules about civility on campus or uh, very distorted, exaggerated concepts of harassment, racial and, and, and gender harassment, colleges are, in fact, punishing ideas merely because they are offensive and cause students to be or faculty be uncomfortable. You, you go back and you uh, look at places where hate speech laws were put in place and they end up harming the very people they were supposedly trying to protect. And you talk about 
1965 British law that was designed to go after a neo-Nazi group, mm -hmm. and it ended up being used to punish the anti-Nazi league. Mm -hmm. How common is that where, you know, they, you, you kind of get hoist on your own petard? It's uh, all hate speech laws, like all laws, are disproportionately enforced against those who lack political power in a democratic society. It's not surprising. Just the way the drug laws are disproportionately enforced against young, dark-skinned men. And the problem is even more acute, Nick, when we're talking about hate speech laws, because the concept is inherently, irreducibly subjective. Hate is an emotion. And what one person hates, somebody else loves. We see that, you know, in today's society, for example, many politicians and other powerful people have denounced Black Lives Matter advocacy as hate speech against white people or against police officers. It's even been accused of causing uh, assassinations of police officers, whereas other people denounce blue lives matter as hate speech or all lives matter as hate speech. So given this inevitable subjectivity, those who enforce the law really have unfettered discretion to enforce their own values about what is hateful and what is dangerous and so forth. You and they're not good. They're they're accountable to the majority. They're not likely to enforce those laws to the benefit of dissenters or minority groups. You uh, you mentioned a case, a late 1980s case at the University of Michigan, where for I guess uh, one or two years they had a hate speech law in place, and it was used to punish a black grad student who thought homosexuality was a mental illness, and he developed a, as part of a project like a, a way basically to convert gays to heterosexuality. So you're saying that's more, it's, it's not just like, oh, that happens on the fringes. That almost always happens. And you know, not laws. only does it almost always happen, Nick, and there are many examples that are going on today uh, in Europe and Canada and all the other countries that do enforce hate speech laws, democratic countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. in the totalitarian, authoritarian countries, it's blatantly singling right. out their political opponents. Uh, but the fact that this happens really follows from the analysis of those who advocate hate speech laws. They argue that we live in a society that has uh, endemic problems of structural and systemic racism including and other forms of discrimination, including in the criminal justice system. I agree with that critique. They argue that all of us living in this society and culture are subject to unintended bias, unconscious bias. I agree. Therefore, I completely reject the vaunted solution of handing over to that discriminatory system and discriminatory uh, individuals the power to pick and choose according to their own values and the values of the majority, which speech is going to be silenced. And I, one of the interesting things that I learned from doing this book, because I'm so used to being accused of American exceptionalism, which, by the way, if we're exceptional in our defense of free speech, I wear that criticism like a badge of honor. Uh, but I thought what was so interesting is that so many human rights activists in other countries that enforce hate speech laws have become so critical of those laws as they see how ineffective they are at best and counterproductive at worst in terms of the very human rights goals and equality goals they were hoping to advance. Your book focuses a lot on government censorship for, for a lot of reasons, but you also talk about how much of our uh, speech and expression now takes place in, in either private places like workplaces or private schools, things like that or kind of semi-private situations, online intermediaries like Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. When Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, testified before Congress uh, recently, he talked a lot about how great, you know, how, how important it was for Facebook to police hate speech. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot about how Facebook, though, has done a lot of stuff that ends up hurting the minorities mm -hmm. that it seems to be protecting. Mm -hmm. And you tend to argue, or you argue kind of, if, I, if I'm reading it right, your first argument is that, you know, basically private places should adopt robust First mm -hmm. Amendment uh, mm -hmm. speech restrictions. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Okay, so first of all, I have to explain to your listeners mm -hmm. what you obviously know, but most people don't, that 
The First Amendment, along with most constitutional rights guarantees, has no binding effect at all on any private sector entities, including private sector campuses and certainly these online powerful companies. Uh, that does not mean that we should not use other tools to try to secure free speech values when they exercise so much practical power, uh, whether we in fact have a free exchange of ideas or not. So. I and others have been trying to advocate uh, against suppression of hate speech even on, on, on Facebook and so forth, even though they're facing enormous political and public pressure to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. But how Facebook, for example, has enforced its hate speech rules, to me, Nick, is a textbook illustration of the inevitable problems, how inevitably vague and subjective the standards are leading to results that are arbitrary and capricious at best, outright discriminatory yeah, at you worst. You talk about how uh, they ended up banning LGBT groups that used the words dyke and fag, which exactly. can... Counter speech, calling out the hate speech for purposes of uh, denouncing the hate mongers and offering support to its victims has been censored. Now, I have to say in its defense, Facebook responds to these criticisms, and I saw that recently they said they are revising their standards so that uh, they will try to protect instances of hateful messages being repeated for denunciatory purposes. But you look at the standards, which, by the way, I think Facebook did recently publish them. Uh, last summer, ProPublica got a trove of these criteria, and I, I should put the word standards in quotation marks, because the examples are, they would be laughable, except that it's no laughing matter. So uh, Facebook said, if you're taught, and it says it to this army of thousands of people around the world, who are enforcing these criteria, uh, that if you're talking about immigrants to a country, because they take each group, group by group, about what you can say and what you can't say, talk about speech codes, I mean, <laughs> um, but so uh, about immigrants, you may use the adjective filthy about them, but you may not use the noun filth about them. Uh, you may say things about them that are degrading, but you may not say things about them that are dehumanizing. So. Okay. Well, that clears that, that clears up. it up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on another level, like how difficult is it? Facebook is also, I mean, you know, they're a business. Twitter is a business. Mm -hmm. You know, and they if they get a, a huge amount of feedback saying like, hey, I don't want to go on there and, and, and you know, hear this kind of talk. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, what, you know, you're, you're making an argument that they should afford broad First mm -hmm. uh, Amendment protections mm -hmm. all over the place, but then what if that hurts their business model? Yeah, so, you know, I completely agree that this is a very difficult area, which is why I just, you know, skim mm -hmm. the surface in, in my book, and I think, but I think realistically this deserves a lot of thought. Uh, I do believe that as a business, they uh, have the prerogative to be responsive to their shareholders. Uh, but I think that behooves the rest of us to be very conscious of that and use whatever power we have to push back as consumers. And some people now are arguing that, well, we need to uh, push for the development of alternative social media that will perhaps be nonprofit. So one of the arguments in the book, a large argument, is that these these laws are, you know, fundamentally incoherent because mm -hmm. it, it becomes so subjective mm -hmm. that it, you know, it's ridiculous to try and define hate speech in any kind of stable way. Another is that these laws hurt the people that they're supposed the, the the speech rights of people who they're supposed mm. to protect. Um, then you also talk at a certain point, you, uh, what chapter six is, do, uh, the title is, does constitutionally protected hate speech actually cause the feared harms? Mm -hmm. What did you find when you looked at the literature? About First the of all, of I do speech? have to underscore two points about Matsuda and others mm -hmm. who were pioneers in making the argument about the psychic and emotional harms of hate speech. I sincerely thank and acknowledge them in the book because I think they made, uh, drew our attention to not only psychic psychic impacts, but also physiological and adverse impacts on free speech. If you feel so um, humiliated and disempowered, you are going to be stunned into silence. So those are serious concerns. Or pushed into weird violence, right? I <laughs> yes, mean, where you, yes, it's very... Exactly, yeah. yeah. However, I do have to point this out, Nick, before directly answering your question, and, and that is that 
the argument usually stops there. I mean, even if we assume for the sake of argument that hate speech inevitably caused harms, it doesn't necessarily follow that censoring it is the right path to reduce those harms. Because censorship may be, and I argue, as we've already discussed, that it is at best ineffective and counterproductive. And moreover, that counter speech and other non-sensorial approaches are more effective. So my argument does not rest on only refuting the asserted harms. So, uh, but it, but let it, me address yeah. that. Um, uh, that I think that the difference between speech, or a major difference between speech and other non-expressive conduct is that speech cannot directly cause harm. It may potentially cause harm, but only through the intermediating, process, intermediating processes of the human mind, right? So I quote Eleanor Roosevelt right. in my book saying- No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Exactly. Yeah. And, and many social psychologists and mental health experts are saying that, uh, that you are not inevitably demeaned just because somebody says something hateful about you. And cognitive behavior therapists and other experts say we can and should teach ourselves and teach our young students from a very early age uh, to have the habits of mind and attitudes and resilience that they can withstand the slings and arrows of of hateful language and oh, well this gets to your uh, you know to the final message of mm -hmm. and you and you were alluding to it where you know the, the proper response in your said so, I mean the cultural response mm -hmm. is to create a more robust society where mm -hmm. we can take this and we can argue with more counter speech uh, and things like that. What are some of the best ways to address what people think of as hate speech, uh, rather than you know just having the government say, okay, you're not allowed to say that? And I think our we can see many examples today. I think today it's hate mongers, for example, in Charlottesville, who are the ones that are disparaged and looked down upon. Uh, so uh, it, you have to look at the particular context. Whatever the harm, potential harm is that you think the speech uh, could cause, you can nip that in the bud. So if you're concerned about the feelings and the self-confidence and the self-respect of people who are disparaged, you can support them, you can mm -hmm. argue in favor of their equality, you can denounce the ideas of the haters. If you're concerned about the hate mongers potentially recruiting college students and others to be supporters, you reach out to those people. Sometimes not necessarily through rational arguments, because as we've been reading through some celebrated cases, it might have to do with something completely different, such as lack of friends and being subject to bullying. But there are just remarkable examples online and, and, and elsewhere uh, of people who, uh, you know, just ordinary members of the community, as well as psychological experts who have reached out to even confirmed hate mongers, even leaders of alt-right type white supremacist groups, and have weaned them away uh, from those beliefs and from that conduct. There's a whole organization, one of many examples I could cite, called Life After Hate, which was founded and is staffed by people who, in the prime of their life for many years, were members of hate groups themselves and have come to see the light. You uh, mentioned a 1984 incident at Harvard where a fraternity circulated a misogynistic pamphlet. Uh, Derek Bach, who was the president of Harvard at the time, said he wasn't going to punish these guys, mm -hmm. but he was also not going to like let it pass unnoticed. Mm -hmm. Why was that an exemplary response for you to how to deal with this kind of thing? I liked that Derek Bach example, and there were others in his administration, because he acknowledged the potentially chilling effect on speech of somebody in such a position of authority as a university president. And he said, I, so he bent over backwards to stress that there would be absolutely no adverse consequence for the students who expressed the misogynistic or other hateful views. But he also said, I have a responsibility as the leader of an institution that rejects those values 
to make it clear that there is no implicit endorsement to the mm -hmm. to the contrary. So he was uh, both messages were equally important. We def it, and it really comes down to that famous statement attributed to Voltaire: mm -hmm. "I disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it." But I'm also exercising my free speech rights, especially as the leader of this community, to make clear on behalf of the uh, the university as a whole that we reject the substance of the message, not your right to say. It. Briefly, talk about the larger culture. You know, um, there seems to be a sense that we're getting more and more overly sensitive, mm -hmm. and you know, we're really polarized, and everybody's going off. How do we reinforce a culture where it's kind of like Eleanor Roosevelt? Eleanor Roosevelt, who, in a certain level, was very privileged, obviously, mm -hmm. but also took a lot of shit, and she was a really steadfast proponent of uh, civil rights and mm -hmm. of, of uh, racial integration and whatnot. Like, how do we get back to that? Mm -hmm. More of an Eleanor Roosevelt and less of a kind of snowflake mentality. And in my book, I quote not only Eleanor Roosevelt, but a lot of African Americans, yeah. including Barack Obama and mm -hmm. Van Jones and Ruth Simmons, right. be, because I think it's very, especially credible, they would be more credible yeah. uh, role models to African American students. It's so important to have the Obamas and the Simmons mm -hmm. and the Van Joneses of the world right. saying, you owe it to yourselves as individuals and to the community that you're representing to develop the ability to uh, withstand whatever efforts the hate mongers are engaging in to try to silence you, to try to make you feel humiliated. No, you've got to rise above that. And Obama is constantly citing the example of the civil rights demonstrators in the 50s and 60s, Martin Luther King and others, who uh, kept saying, you know, hate's not going to drive out hate, only love will do that. And learning to engage with those who were uh, arguing against their civil rights message by hearing them and by responding to them. And you're not going to develop effective arguments unless you listen to them as well. Uh, Randy Kennedy, who's an African-American law professor at, at Harvard and a great advocate of civil rights and civil liberties, is working on a whole book about this. Uh, and he's holding up the civil rights movement as and the students who were so active in that movement as a model to minority students today. Uh, that they are just not going to be effective in achieving their goals of reducing racial discrimination and racial injustice unless they learn to answer back, not allow themselves to be silenced or uh, to feel demeaned, but to make society look down on those who are uh, detracting from, from their equal status. Well, we will leave it there. We have been talking with Nadine Strassen. She's a law professor, law scholar, and former head of the ACLU. Her latest book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Nadine, thanks for Thank talking. Thank you so much, Nick. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.